Let's pray. Father God, you have watched over us and you have taken care of us and you have provided for us in so many ways since we were last together. We thank you for your many mercies. We thank you for your many promises. We thank you most of all for the forgiveness of our sins, which has been our glorious experience every day. As, as you have forgiven our sins, past, present and future, without compulsion and without restraint. And Father, we come before you tonight as your sons and daughters, um, those greatly beloved by God. And we thank you for the opportunity that we have to consider our lives in the light of your word, to consider our lives in the light of the calling to minister to other people, the wonderful graces of the gospel as people struggle with um, crises and transitions in their lives. So we ask that tonight you would bless us and you would grant us your wisdom and your peace because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I have a, uh, um, from the New Zealand Herald, 2006. Uh, headlines on the front page was um, Mental Illness Strikes 1 and 2. Official study discovers New Zealand's disorders rates are high by world standards. This comes from a, the first national survey of the prevalence of common mental problems in New Zealand, depression, anxiety, alcohol or drug abuse, bipolar disorder and eating disorders. They are based on interviews of nearly 13,000 people aged 16 or older. These are some of their findings. Nearly half of New Zealanders will have a mental disorder at some time in their life. Women were more prone to anxiety, major depression and eating disorders than men, but males were much more likely than females to have substance misuse disorders. It found that in the 12 months before the survey, anxiety disorders affected 15% of those surveyed, mood disorders 8%, substance misuse 3.5% and eating disorders 0.5%. So by far the greatest were anxiety disorders. In depression, for instance, symptoms such as a low mood, poor sleep and low energy must be experienced for at least a fortnight to qualify as a disorder. Psychotic disorders such as schizophrenia were excluded as they are uncommon, affecting only 0.3% of the people surveyed. Thoughts of suicide were more common among Maori Pacific people, females, young people and those in poor areas. The Director of Mental Health, Janice Wilson, said the absence of differences between town and country was a surprise. We thought that if you lived in the cities you might be more likely to suffer mental disorder than in rural areas where there might be more support, she said. The fact was there's no difference between rural people and urban people. Rural people do have their lows and burden of problems. So, as we talk about this course and as we get into this course, we are dealing with the fact that we live in a culture where people experience mental disorder at an increasing rate. So, what are we going to do as people who are indwelt by the Spirit of God? What are we going to do to play our part in bringing hope and healing? Well, let me just hand this out as uh, the introduction to the course. <coughs> This class will examine the major transitions and crises of the human lifespan. We will cover birth, infancy, childhood, adolescence, singleness, marriage, parenthood, midlife, retirement, aging and death. So we're going to look at the, uh, the span of human life and we're going to look at it in terms of its stages of development. And we're going to begin with birth and we're going to end with death, death and dying. And we're going to look at, uh, as we have there, infancy, childhood, adolescence, and so on. And we're going to see that that uh, everybody transitions from one, one stage to the next in the course of their life. Now, in the transition, as they go from one to the next, 
at the point of transition, there can often occur a crisis. And so as people are concerned about helping other people in pastoral counselling situation, if you're aware that someone is going through a life transition, you can be uh, uh, sensitive to and aware of a crisis that might be particular to that particular transition and structure your conversation and your questions accordingly. Our purpose will be to develop a counselling perspective that helps others cope with these transitions of life and the crises these transitions can often bring. Throughout this course, students will be encouraged to compare their own life experiences to these transitional phrases, uh, phases of the human lifespan. Uh, here are the course requirements. There's two textbooks, uh, Caring for People from Birth to Death and The Developing Person Through the Lifespan. And uh, here they are here. Um, let's have a look here. guys might have to share this one yeah. in case someone else turns up now these are both uh, these are both library books so um, they need to be returned in the condition in which they're received uh, and um, both these books have to be read in their entirety and uh, <coughs> notice that in the first term that's term three uh, <coughs> the big book Kathleen Berger, the Berger book, read one, parts one to five only, which is about half a book. You'll read the other half uh, next term, <coughs> in term four. So if you take the big one, the Berger book, and you open it up to the contents page, you'll see the book's divided up into eight parts, eight, uh, each part corresponding to stage of the lifespan. So we begin with... Uh, <coughs> The first two years, the play years, the school years, adolescence, early adulthood, middle adulthood, later adulthood. And so for the term three, you only have to read uh, the first five parts from beginnings through to adolescence. Next term we'll do early, early adulthood through to death and dying. Uh, now, so uh, this book also has to be read um, in the course of both terms. So in other words, next term the reading requirement won't be, won't be, any, uh, won't be added to. This is the reading requirement for both terms. So it gives you both terms to read Hightower and Berger. On the exam you'll be asked what percentage of this reading, um, required reading you've completed. So that will be the first uh, parts one to five of Berger. And uh, at the end of the year that uh, question will relate to both Berger and Hightower. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's the reading. The term paper, choose a particular period of the lifespan that you would like to explore in more detail. Describe the major changes, opportunities and challenges of that period of life, relating it all to your own experience of that stage of your development. So in other words, I'm asking you to choose a life <coughs> period of the lifespan that you yourself have gone through. Uh, and uh, describe the major changes, opportunities and challenges relating it all to your own experience of that stage of your development. From the public library or some other source, read a book that deals with that lifespan period, referencing it, referencing it in your paper. Make use also of the class textbooks, notes, handouts, discussions. This paper will remain confidential to your tutor as a guide, aim for, etc, etc. Ten pages, 1.5 spacing, 12 point font, no spaces between paragraphs, indent first line of the paragraph. Now, um, to give you an idea, uh, to help you with the kind of books you could source for your paper, here's some recommendations. And uh, not all of these are Christian, some of them are, but they're all books that relate to different stages of the lifespan. So for your paper, I'm asking you to find another book and uh, which you will reference in the course of your term paper. Then there's a the two-hour exam at the end of the term. Now, you notice the weighting there is 60% on the term paper. It's an indication that uh, that's the most significant part of the uh, course requirements. 
because it's as you do your own reflection on your experience of transition and crisis and as you do your own research on that using Berger and Hightower and any other book that you get perhaps from that list perhaps from somewhere else um, so I want you to interact with this material so that it becomes a part of you and so that you can very naturally make that a part of your counselling ministry. Uh, the exam is necessary because there are just some things you need to know. Two hour exam, that's right. Any questions or comments about course requirements? Uh, there's the class schedule, and you see that the class schedule is, uh, you know, you can follow Berger along on the class schedule, so uh, introduction to the lifespan uh, th tonight and next week, uh, you should have part one of Berger read by the beginning of next week, and then part two of Berger for those two lectures on conception and infancy, uh, Berger read for early childhood. Uh, there's no class on August the 23rd, I'll give you a break to catch up on your reading and assignments. And uh, part four for middle childhood and part five for the two lectures on adolescence. So kind of keep your reading of Berger at pace with the lecture material that way you'll find that most helpful. Okay, here's our lecture for tonight. <clears throat> Introduction to the lifespan. In this course we are concerned with the physical, mental, social and spiritual changes observable throughout the human lifespan. Now I've put in brackets there, uh, biosocial, cognitive and psychosocial because you're going to come across those terms in your reading. Um, uh, Berger is, is not a Christian author. She's a secularist and so she'll be using terms which may be unfamiliar to you. Hightower is a believer and that will give you his perspective on caring for people from birth to death. So you're going to come across references like biosocial, cognitive, psychosocial. So I just wanted you to know that they're related to um, those, those particular aspects of the lifespan. Uh, Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 verse 52. Uh, it's talking about Jesus and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and men. Now uh, <clears throat> that's the human lifespan there that is um, uh, Jesus grew in wisdom mental cognitive, he grew in stature physical or biosocial he grew in favour with men that's social or psychosocial and in favour with God that's spiritual. So you see what's common to Jesus is common to all humanity and the secularists have picked up on those stages not because they're in the Bible but because they're observed in people's lives and so that's how they've dealt with the development of uh, people over the lifespan from birth to maturity in those major areas. So of those four, wisdom, stature and favour with God, uh, with men and with God, this last one, favour with God or spiritual development is not included in the secular material we're using for this course. So Berger, for instance, won't be talking about spiritual development. We will have to provide that aspect for ourselves, noting where this failure of sexual, of uh, secular observations distorts the understanding of all other aspects. The fact that they leave the spiritual out of consideration will distort their understanding of the other areas, physical, social and uh, cognitive. There are 
are discernible patterns to lifespan development with expected transitions and often associated crises at each stage. Effective pastoral counselling will take account of these expectations. Now, these discernible patterns to life stage development uh, are discernible to everyone, particularly to a mother as she's watching her child grow. There's obviously um, there's a pattern to lifespan development that is common to all. And so the, uh, the secularists have, have looked at this and they've observed it, and they've observed that sometimes the transitions uh, aren't made easily and happily. Often the transition results in trauma and stress and crisis. And so a lot of study has been uh, spent on human development over the lifespan. And uh, <clears throat> these are some of the things that, that have surfaced in the course of all that research. Lifespan development patterns show these following four things. They show uh, a structure, a structure that's common to everyone it's universal, a universal structure regardless of race or culture. Everyone starts out here and goes through all these stages all the way to here. Everyone is born, everybody dies, and in between everyone experiences these transitions. From, from infancy to childhood, from childhood to adolescence, from adolescence to middle age and so on. There's a structure. Not only is there a structure, but there is a sequence there's a sequence that can be expected and looked forward to. Um, babies roll over before they crawl, then walk and then run. You see there's a sequence there. So when a, when a baby is born, the, the parents are expecting and looking forward to the sequential changes to take place in that child's development. Now why would they be looking forward to that? Why would they expect that? Well, because it happens to everybody. It's universal. And so... Uh, you don't, uh, a child who hasn't yet learned to crawl, uh, people don't ask the, um, ask the parents, well, when do you expect your child to start running? Well, he hasn't started to crawl yet. You see, there's a sequence to it. He crawl, then walk, then run. Or, for instance, the child learning to talk, sounds become words, words become sentences, and sentences translate into reading ability. There's a sequence. There's structure, there's sequence, there's evidence of design. These changes that take, that take place don't take place randomly. In other words, it's not like you jump from here to here, then back to here, and then over to here. It's not a random, uh, disorganized. Um, rather, there's a pattern to it, there's a design to it, nor is it an evolutionary process. We can't say, for instance, that the, the newborn evolves into infancy and then evolves into childhood. Rather, lifespan development is, uh, shows evidence of the controlling providence of God. Uh, for example, some babies walk sooner than others. And while this may cause some grief, to parents, particularly first-time parents, when uh, the babies are not meeting the uh, percentiles on the on the um, Plunkett chart, you know there's concern, and you look at the Plunkett chart, and there's a line, and then above the line there's crosses that are exception, below the line there's crosses, but everybody wants their baby to at least be on the line or above the line, and and r really you see it's it's not it's not random. So wherever your child is in its development, or whether any one of us are in our development here, it's not random. It's under the controlling providence of God. It's not by design, it's not by evolutionary process. Are there things that we can do to assist the development and the transition? Well, yes, there is. We'll get to that. So there's structure, there's sequence, there's evidence of design, and also lifespan development is throughout life. Lifespan transitions continue through the whole of a person's lifetime. It doesn't stop. It goes all the way through. We're, we're continuing to go through those, these transitions right up until the moment we draw our last breath. Well, thinking about um, uh, lifespan development, then we could ask some questions about that. Do the early, early years of development determine and influence subsequent growth and development? Do the early years of, develop, of development determine subsequent growth? Do they influence subsequent growth? I mean, if a child uh, 
doesn't learn to walk until much later from other children, does this, does this have something to say about his subsequent development in other areas? Uh, if, um, if something happens in the child's life back here in birth or in infancy, uh, is that going to have an effect on their subsequent development? Does, um, does the early years of development determine or influence subsequent growth and development? That's a question that's asked by people who do this kind of research. Does change and development stop after the early years? In other words, do you reach a point where there's no more change and growth? You see, uh, you know, there's a lot of change takes place in newborns, a lot of change takes place in, in infancy, a lot of change takes place, say, in adolescence. Between infancy and adolescence, there's a kind of a pause. You know, the primary school years between nappies and hormones. There's a pause there where everyone kind of takes a breath. Wow, and gets an equilibrium back into order. And then we had adolescence and another huge burst of development takes place. Well, what about after adolescence? Does development stop there? And everything just kind of stays static until we, until we die? Or does development continue? You see, because, our, we, because we stop growing somewhere around adolescence, the assumption is that we stop growing in every other area as well is their ongoing development. <coughs> is temperament and personality determined at birth just restrict, thus uh, restricting the scope of future development? Is there something laid down at birth or prior to birth in the womb, is there something laid down which determines temperament and personality? You know, often you'll, you'll hear people say, parents will say of their, of their little children, you know, we, we, we saw his little personality beginning to develop at a very early age. You see, and what's the assumption behind that? That whatever that is, is, is kind of there now forever. It's like a child is born with blue eyes, and the parent says, oh, my child was born with blue eyes, therefore he and she will have blue eyes for the rest of their life. Well, that's how we think about uh, temperament personality. The difference between the two, mind you, the terms temperament and personality are psychological terms, they're psychological constructs, they certainly don't, certainly not, not, in the, not a biblical construct, and the understanding between those two is that temperament is something that we're born with, and personality is something that develops on top of that temperament, so the temperament is kind of the, 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 the first floor, and how, uh, sorry, the, uh, yeah, the temperament is the first floor, and however that temperament is put together determines the direction the personality will take. Well, personality is a Freudian concept. It was Freud who came up with the idea of personality, and uh, he, um, he observed that people are different, and that those differences could be classified, and people could be put into groups, and each group could be labelled with a certain label to identify the characteristics of that group and the way they behaved and responded. And those labels became, uh, became far more than just explanations. Those labels became determinative. So if, uh, if, uh, if a child is born melancholic, then they'll be melancholic for the rest of their life. See, it's like blue eyes. If a child is born sanguine, these are all personality definitions, they'll be sanguine for the rest of their lives. Well, does that mean then that this determines uh, age-stage development in the lifespan, this, this so-called uh, temperament and personality? Do they restrict the scope of future development? In other words, can people really change? Or are they locked in from birth, genetically or whatever other way? Are they locked in and, and should that uh, qualify our expectations when we're involved in helping them and counselling them? Uh, <clears throat> what should be our expectations for change when, say, counselling an 80-year-old? By the time you get down to this end of the lifespan and you find yourself going into a rest home to counsel somebody, what would your, how, should your expectations be any different than if you're counselling someone down at this end of the lifespan? You see? In other words, what, what, what's your understanding? Do people continue to change and develop or do they kind of stop somewhere? So this is as far as it goes. What should our expectations be of someone who's 80 compared to someone who's 8? 
because of the power of the indwelling life of Christ, we can say that change and growth in godliness is possible at any stage of the lifespan. The heart does not grow old. Aha! The heart does not grow old. The body grows old, but not the heart. So, you can counsel the heart of an eight-year-old and expect to see growth and long-lasting life change. You can counsel the heart of an 80-year-old and expect to see growth and long-lasting life change. Because the heart doesn't grow old. The heart's not affected by the physical development and aging of the body. The outward wastes away, but the inward remains alive and active. Okay, any uh, thoughts or comments thus far? Just with, uh, working with the elderly and uh, through nursing and, uh, and I noticed that the mindset, as you said, the heart, but they, it's like if they've done a reverse, they've gone back to birth, like they had to be, and, and they start recording things right. were from from birth and to, and they look upon you and so um, yeah so so they kind of revert back yeah. to childhood and infancy childhood. yes infancy. yes and, and so and all these other yes medical terms that they put in now but it's evident that even at times then there's a full recollections of who they are they come back to those moments and then and they go through the, the, you know, on the hourly time, they go through their medication, go through their physio and do everything else. And then they left in their room and then they revert back to this infancy. The sort of, yeah. But then spirit, you know, and then with the recognising of a child or like my children uh, and in relation to my wife working within the nursing home. Uh, and they sort of interact automatically with the child, regardless of their age and who they are, and they they remember things. Right. And they interact. Right. And then those ones that are very that's mine, and they you know it's like you know like little children. Yeah. <laughs> very good. Influences that may help or hinder this pattern of development. The experiences of physical, emotional, sexual, spiritual or substance abuse or the presence of genetic disorders can dominate a person's lifespan development, either arresting it or slowing it down. So if something happens here, one of these lifespans in here, uh, on that list that I've mentioned, it may affect their ability to transition into their li next lifespan, which is coming up inevitably, it might affect their ability to transition in and hence produce a crisis. Uh, for example, here's a, here's a high school boy who starts smoking marijuana and he's a regular user of marijuana through his adolescent years. And when it comes time for him to transition from adolescent into uh, young adulthood, he finds, or she finds, suddenly that there's a crisis. Because in young adulthood they're now faced with responsibilities in life they never had as an adolescent, but they can't cope with those responsibilities because marijuana has arrested their emotional development. And uh, emotionally, they're still trapped right back here as a 14-year-old, and now here they are as a 24-year-old, trying to face life as a 24-year-old with the emotional development of a 14-year-old. See how substance abuse has affected their ability to transition without crisis into the next stage of the lifespan. So, if you're talking to a young man in his 20s, and he's having trouble with uh, dealing with life's responsibilities, you can ask him if he's ever been a user of marijuana. See, why would you ask that? Well, you're beginning to understand that these kinds of things that happen in this stage can affect your ability to transition into the next stage. Uh, certainly uh, sexual abuse, sexual abuse that would take place very early on in a, in a child's life may, um, may affect their ability to transition into, um, into a, a sexually active adult in a marriage, in a marriage relationship, for instance. Uh, someone who has endured uh, spiritual abuse, 
back here perhaps will find it very hard to transition into a uh, into adulthood where they're now responsible, say, if they're a man, responsible for the spiritual direction of their family because of their experience of spiritual abuse, they, um, they're very hesitant and it's not, uh, it's, it's, it becomes a crisis for them when they're faced with the, with the perspective, the demand, the responsibility of bringing spiritual leadership into the home. in spite of these negative influences, the heart can still be touched by the gospel with the resultant spiritual life and growth. Other developments throughout the lifespan, the result of genetics or environment? This is the nature or nurture argument. Now, we've already said that the development of the lifespan is under the overall providence of God. It's not random, it's not evolutionary. God in his providence oversees the lifespan. However, uh, <clears throat> what's the uh, result, what's the effect of genetics or environmental factors on that development? The commonality of the human lifespan indicates a strong genetic disposition, uh, disposition of growth toward maturity. Uh, <clears throat> Basically because everyone grows from, from birth to infancy to adolescent to maturity physically, because that happens to everybody, then, then we can assume that it's, it's genetic, it's part of our DNA as human beings to pursue that maturing and growth and development. Uh, and uh, yet nurture deprivations can severely inhibit, inhibit this development. For instance, children neglected in an orphanage and never receiving that psychosocial involvement in their lives can grow up emotionally deprived. This can also happen to children who grow up in homes which uh, are without any emotional connection or involvement. And so they come into adulthood with this huge emotional deficits in their lives and are unable to transition into loving and stable adult relationships. You see, it's a deprivation of their nurture, nothing to do with genetics. However, genetic abnormalities can occur, like Down syndrome, which does affect the ability to transition successfully from one stage to another. So, under the providence of God, the whole of creation is groaning because of sin, and that groaning is, uh, surfaces as we observe lifespan development in human beings and fallen human beings, both in nature and nurture both in genetics and in environment. Once again, we have to say that these negative influences don't prevent opportunity for the heart to be touched by the gospel through effective pastoral care and counselling. Uh, here's another question. Are these observed developments towards maturity as we go from one to the other? Are these uh, <clears throat> observed developments towards maturity the result of God's sovereignty or of our human efforts? In other words, can we do anything to facilitate the movement from one lifespan to another? Can we do anything to help ourselves or to help others move through these transitions? Uh, do we have an active part to play or is, it, is our role passive and these things are just going to happen automatically and naturally? Well, God's providence ensures the development of the human person to maturity. However, his sovereignty ensures that significance is given to our efforts along the way. For instance, at learning to read, training for life tasks. So you teach a child to read. Um, you start reading to a newborn. There's a newborn's line in your arms, and uh, the, you, you pick up a book and you just start reading to them. And, and you're reading to them, you know that you are, uh, they're going to grow up around words, around sentences, and, uh, and it's going to help them to develop as, as an infant who begins using words and as a young child who begins to read. Now, you see, studies have shown that if a child grows up without any books in the home, if a child grows up without anyone reading to them, they get to school and they're starting from scratch, they find it's, it takes a long time for them to catch up, and if they fall through the cracks at school, they'll go into adulthood uh, unable to read. So, you see, there's much that can be done to... Uh, <coughs> to assist. Um, 
training for life tasks. I mean, you, you think of a 18, or a 18 year old school ever going into an apprenticeship. So as a builder's apprentice, you see, and, and you see that that apprenticeship is going to help that adolescent transition into adulthood. It's going to help them reach adulthood able to have the skills and the sense of responsibility and the belief in themselves that they can actually do something as an adult. Well, you see, if, if without that help and training and mentoring, if we just left the adolescents alone just to do what comes naturally, they'll go into adulthood without ever really growing up, without ever really feeling confident enough to take on responsibilities. And so as a, as, as a, a 30 and a 40 and a 50 year old, they remain largely unemployable. So you see there's much that we can do to uh, ensure the development of a human person to maturity. So God's help can be sought in each and every stage of physical, cognitive, social and spiritual development as we involve ourselves with other people to assist in that life stage development. Okay, now those are some of the commonly asked questions about, uh, about people and growth to maturity. Uh, have you got any comments about any of those things that I've just said? From a very early age, with the mother, in the pregnancy of my of my children, at, whilst in the womb, my wife, who we were going, because of our daughter, and my not my biological daughter, the first one, she was a twin, she was 24 weeks, uh, 24 weeks um, premature. She was four months, and she was the surviving one of the twin, and there was a difference. And the twins, the one that the, the one that passed five minutes of life, and then passed. She was a lot larger than this one, than Kay, the surviving one. She was diagnosed with spinal bifida and being um, had all the steroids. They applied all the steroids and that to her life, and which caused her organs to grow lopsided. One side of all the organs were inflamed, and, and she'd be having a left hip without the ball in the, inside the lip um, hip socket and was a spinal bifida with three missing vertebrae in their lower back. So they clarified it as a spinal bifida and so this child today is the downside of uh, um, so like what they call hyperdepth, the uh, hypertension and all that. Well she's the downside of that. She's very, she sees things uh, backward. She looks at the, uh, at the blackboard or those in front and she'll write it upside down and that's how she sees it. It wasn't until the day that said we took her in and actually got her to check out some glasses and then that's when we realised that uh, that her whole vision and everything was so... So we did a lot of work with her uh, from the very early age prior to kindergarten and, and with her speech, she had a speech impairment, she had agnoids that were twice the size of an adult, they had to come out at a later stage when she was six, she had overgrown uh, teeth that were on top of that. So she had gone through a transformation with this with the surgery and also with the um, uh, with the ongoing uh, education that went to a speech therapist and I'm not dogging because she was Indian, but the way she spoke to my daughter and my daughter could not understand her. I'm, I'm not laughing at her because of, cause, you know, they do they speak really fast. And my daughter looked at it, couldn't understand it and she was being quite uh, pressurising towards my daughter and she was not, she couldn't understand. I can see that she was struggling to understand what this woman And I said, could you please, uh, you know, it's good we please put this apart and I went and spoke to the doctor and he got a different speech therapist to because my daughter was simply trying to understand and she was courteous and then and then but then she could sense there was a threat there that and she was very frightened from that. Um, she's had that through all uh, more so recently she's had the uh, had the loss of both myself and then uh, then them, the passing of their mother. And the diff and the difficulties that I believe that transitioning through is this Myself not being in the, into where we are today, so I'm very pleased that came along to my Because I too was in that place in between who I was as a person and how it is for us to interact with our children, to educate as such as what I've just 
They just said, hey, I did all this. And then suddenly taking out the course of uh, methamphetamines and drugs and narcotics, not because I take it, but because and certain things and the behaviours that come with it and all the finances around surrounding it. And so, so your daughter was born with severe genetic, genetic abnormalities, which would have arrested quite significantly her ability to transition. But your involvement, your wife's involvement, her mother's involvement in her life enabled her to make those transitions far better than she would have otherwise. So we have, we have, a, uh, we have a combination here of nature and nurture, or if you like, genetics and environment, um, which, is, which is the... Um, you know all this publicity right now in New Zealand about the government paying people to care for family members you know I mean and, and why is that important because this care really does make a difference and 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 people are these these people with these uh, severe disabilities are in fact a lot better off and able to function a lot more better a lot better if they have that kind of care so we can help, we can make a difference. Now, see, you translate that into a pastoral counselling situation. Here's someone who's struggling with a life change transition and you come along as a pastoral care person and the same, the same kind of principle applies. As you involve yourself in their heart, in their world and in their life, as you step into that and as you talk to them and as you expose their heart issues and you bring them to the throne of grace where they can receive mercy in time of need, so, you see, you can help them with that transition. You can walk with them in that transition. So the crisis that might have eventuated uh, might still eventuate, but it won't be paralyzing. It won't arrest their development. It won't keep them back here. So we can have a, a huge part to play within uh, the providence of God. Let's just look at... Um, We've, we've talked about the universality of life change development. There's a structure that's common to everyone, there's a sequence that's common to everyone, there's an evidence designed for everyone, and it's throughout life for everyone. But now we're going to look at where life's, life's, uh, life, uh, human lifespan development is different in different situations. Uh, shared age-related changes. These are changes common to all at any age stage. For example, every person transition, transitions through puberty and, uh, into adolescence. So where we go from puberty to adolescence, for instance, that's a, that's a life stage change that is particular to that life stage. And the issues that are faced there and the crisis that might arrive from that transition is not seen at any other point on the life and the lifespan development either before or after. It's very particular. So you go down here, you see, and someone who's transitioning from old age to old odd age is, is going through a transition that's particular to that age stage. Someone who's going down here, transitioning from um, a child starting school, first day of school, there's a crisis as a transition. As he goes from being at home with his mother all day to going to school, and if they're going to a public school, you see, there's, there could be a crisis there. And, and so it's a crisis that's unique to that child and, and the particular aspects of that crisis will never be repeated that way in that child's life anywhere down here. It's unique to that age stage. So hence, you see, when, when we think about pastoral care, it's not just a matter of saying, oh, we we'll treat everyone the same. See, we have to have some understanding of what's going on at this particular life stage. What's going on that's, that's peculiar to this particular transition that could cause a particular crisis to arise which they won't encounter, which they haven't encountered before, hence not that well equipped to deal with it, and they won't encounter in the future, but they have to face it now. Hence it's very important that, that we as uh, age stage counsellors have some understanding of not only our own experiences in transition, but the experiences of others up ahead of us that we haven't got to yet. So that shared age related changes. There's Cohort specific changes. These are changes common to a particular group. Uh, such a cohort just means a group. Uh, such as war veterans or baby boomers or immigrants. You see, and we, 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 we bring these cohorts together and we, we do research on them and we have statistics for them because they're a particular group of people. And, um, and the changes that they experience are not universal, they're not experienced by everyone. So for instance, uh, 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 a war veteran coming back from a, a war zone 
into a peace situation goes through a crisis and a transition which is particular to war veterans. The post-traumatic stress disorder that they might experience is particular to um, their experience. It's cohort specific. Uh, another uh, cohort specific change could be um, people going through divorce. Or, uh, and so you might have a, um, you might, they might have, they meet together as a cohort, see, so and talk about those experiences because they're particular to them. Or, or adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse, for instance, they're another cohort, you see, and they might get together and, 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 uh, and a person who's involved in counselling or helping them is aware that they're dealing with a, a specific transition and crisis for them, which isn't common to everybody. What about cultural specific changes? These are changes common to any one culture. Uh, and uh, for example, Maori transitioning from rural to urban living, or Maori teenagers transitioning into whanau and iwi identity as they, um, as they come into a, uh, a renaissance, an understanding of their cultural identity, and there, there might be a transition required for them to go from the culture that they're familiar with into a new cultural identity. Um, you saw this particularly in the movie uh, Well Rider. Uh, so, as we think about uh, counselling in a in a multicultural or a, a bicultural situation that we have, particularly here in South Auckland, um, where the chances are, if you're involved in counselling people in a church situation or in a professional capacity, you're going to come up against many different cultures. Um, and and you, you, you're going to have to be able to, able to ask yourself what particular crisis and transition ap uh, applies to this culture that I'm dealing with here, whether it's Maori or whether it's uh, an Indian or whether it's a Pacific Island person, whether it's an Asian. What particular crises are they facing as they transition into life in New Zealand? Could be South African. You see, there's going to be cultural specific uh, changes common to that culture. Uh, unique non-shared changes. These are changes not necessarily shared by others, e.g. divorce, loss of a child, job redundancies. Uh, in all of this, the purpose and goal of our pastoral counselling of lifespan development issues must be spiritual maturity, a growing knowledge and love of God that impacts on every aspect of our life and relationships, our transitions and resultant crises. Okay, any thoughts or comments? You see, this helps us to understand a little bit of the difficulties that arise in marriage. The difference between men and women. You see, women will go through crises and transitions and they'll experience them as different, different from men. And uh, you, know that, um, you know that dreadful song that's sung in the My Fair Lady? Why can't a woman be more like a man? Sung by a man, obviously. You see, and, and, and the assumption is that, you know, a woman's life would be so much better if she just functioned like a man. In other words, if she faced the transitions in life the way men do. But of course they don't. And why should they? Creating the image of God, male and female. So women face transition and crisis very differently from men. They experience the transitions differently, they experience the crises differently. They have a crisis in this transition where their husband may have no crisis in this particular transition. He goes through smoothly and she doesn't, or it might be the other way around. He's going through a midlife crisis of his own and, and, and she's perfectly happy, you know. She's having a great time with the kids and he's, he's really sweating it out. And, and you know, that if we don't have this understanding that, that uh, it's different for different folks. You see, where's our, where's our empathy? Where's our love? Where's our tolerance? Where's our patience? Well, have you, uh, have you in your short lives had any experience with shared age-related changes, cohort-specific changes, cultural-specific changes, unique non-shared changes? Yeah. Divorce. 
it wasn't very common in my circles, so it wasn't very understood. Yeah, that is quite a um, transition. Transition I didn't choose, so that kind of made it harder, I guess. Um, yeah, it certainly took some work in. So you say it wasn't that common in your community. So was that quite a um, an isolating event for you? Yeah. And um, then there was, well, because it happened overseas and then coming back, so there was also that thrown into it. And, um, it got pretty complicated. So what... what, what, what didn't um, know what happened over there to make it happen, I guess. So what, what helped you to get through that transition from marriage to singleness? There's a transition from marriage and a crisis. What, what helped you to get through that? Well, at the end of the day, family was actually a big part of it. Just Your nuclear family? Yeah. yeah. I found out that in the end, despite all their faults, they were there and they still wanted to take care of me. That was good. Um, and God was there. Um, I, I really learned that, I guess, that really made me realise, or through it I learned that God was there all the time, whether I knew it or not, or saw it or not, but I certainly started to see how he was doing things. Yeah. So the importance of, of family to, mm. to help you through that, with with uh, what? what? What was it that the family provided that was helpful? You said they were there for you. Were they? Was there anything else there? Was it what they said or what they did or was it just their presence? Yeah, sometimes just their presence. And, well, I mean, yeah, they actually surprisingly didn't have a lot to say about it. As much as they weren't trying to teach me what I did wrong or anything, I guess they realised I already knew that. So. Yeah. I loved, I guess. You felt loved, you guess. Well, I know that's really what it was. It wasn't. I guess I didn't have to prove I was right with them. I mean, they accepted me whether I was right or wrong, basically. I think they let me work out whether I was right or wrong. Along the way, so. So you you experienced a transition from from m m being married to being single, and in that transition you were faced with a crisis, a crisis which you were greatly helped to work through by the empathetic presence and understanding mm -hmm. of family. Mm -hmm. So the family, you see, were providing that uh, empathetic counselling role yeah, there was by being involved in your life. There were certain other individuals that really helped too, and there was other people that I thought would help, but they just... So the other for years, but they just had a totally different way of thinking about. You know, they had their belief about marriages. So, 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 so those other people who helped you besides family, mm. what, what, what was it about them that that helped? Well, they kind of weren't in a hurry, I think. Actually, they gave they you time. New, yeah, they take the time to get to know me, and they didn't have an agenda. They weren't trying to fix me. Yeah, I think they even saw that it must be really bad if it's happened, like, because they knew that I wouldn't just let it happen. Like, there must be other stuff going on where the other people thought, oh, we could easily fix it because, you know, it's my fault, it just, I don't know, it must have just fallen apart for whatever reason, quickly or something, but the other people knew, now nah, this is something, because they know me, I wouldn't let that happen, so... Okay, so they trusted you, they gave you time, they were patient, mm -hmm. they had no agenda, they didn't try to force anything on you. Mm -hmm. They they gave uh, the Lord the time that, that he wanted to take to bring you through that. Yeah. yeah. That's a wonderful experience of the care of others. Looking back at this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, anyone else? Any of those? Uh, well, all of us have... Um, gone through shared age-related changes. All of us have experienced the changes that, that are common to all of us, uh, mankind. Um, the, uh, my, my transition from adolescence to adulthood was particularly painful 
um, for a number of reasons, and, and, and one is that I had a very bad speech impediment all through my adolescent years, right through to my early 20s, and I wasn't able to, I wasn't able to speak a sentence, a full sentence. Um, uh, all through those years, those adolescent years. Now, you, you know, all of a sudden it just started when I hit adolescence, and, and it stopped in my early 20s. And, but you can imagine how that was, uh, for an adolescent, trying to figure out, as a young man, try to figure out where he belonged in an adult world, an adult world which was suddenly not a safe place at all because there wasn't a lot of tolerance out there for someone who couldn't put a sentence together. Um, so that was a transition which was extremely painful and, you know, my parents, bless their hearts, sent me off to speech therapists and, you know, tried, did all they could but the reality was that nothing was going to make a difference. Um, God and his timing brought about a change. So some of these things we can't fix. We just have to bear with others and show love and grace. Okay, well look, let's say we take a break and come back in about five minutes or so and we'll finish this off. Uh, let's just look here briefly at the biblical framework in which to understand lifespan development. Uh, creation for redemption glory. Here's something that's common to humanity. We've all been created in the image of God. We've all fallen. We're all in rebellion. Effect of sin. Um, redemption has come to those who put their faith in Christ. So for forgiveness and new life. And for those united to Christ by faith there is a future hope of unimaginable glory the return of the king now that's the paradigm in which we have to understand people and work with people and counsel people and it's no different going through the uh, uh, lifespan development when it comes to helping people with lifespan development transition, we cannot proceed without knowing the beginning and end of their story, or of the story of God's work in creation. Secular theories of development are concerned only with the middle portion. So this is where secular theories come down. See, and you can understand that. See, a secular theory does not hold to creation in the image of God. A secular theory does not hold to glory, the future hope of an unimaginable glory. You know, we live like dogs and we die like dogs. There's nothing beyond the grave. And so the secularists can deal only with the, with the middle portion. Only they don't talk about fall and redemption. They talk about problems, struggles, difficulties, and they talk about solutions, inner healing, um, self-actualization, whatever solution that their theory can produce to help the struggle is their understanding of the fall and their understanding of salvation. They have produced through their secular theories their own ways of saving people from their struggles. Now, the secularists are created in the image of God, so in spite of their fallenness, in spite of their sin, they can't help but act as image bearers and deal with the reality of the fall and the reality of man's need for redemption. But rather than going to the scriptures, rather than going to God for an understanding of the fall and understanding of redemption, they bring in their own substitute theories. But you see, what they're grappling with is the effects of the fall. Here we go. Transitioning from one life stage to another is not on account of the fall. That's on account of our creatureliness. We're, we were created to go from birth to maturity. 
It's the crisis in the transition that is accounted for by the fall. The reason that it's not a smooth transition like it would have been in the Garden of Eden before Genesis 3, it's not a smooth transition because of the fall. And so the secular theorists come along and they see the struggle that people have from going from one tra from transitioning from one stage to the other. So they see the struggle, the resulting crisis, and they say, aha, there is a problem. Now they don't call it rebellion and the effect of sin, they call it something else, they put their own label on it, and then they come up with their own solution for it to help people over this crisis. What do they believe and what do they care about? They believe that people struggle. What do they care about? Helping people with their struggle. Very noble, very noble. But you see, uh, to proceed without knowing the beginning of the story and the end of the story is to operate in a blind. Is to operate without the beginning and without the end. And so they just go round and round in the middle with the reality of the fall and the reality of the need to do something about that fall and without that struggle. So without any understanding of man or woman being created in the image of God and without any understanding of a future hope of unimaginable glory beyond the grave, they've got really nothing that can effectively help people with long-lasting life change. I know that's quite a bold statement, but we'll just unpack it a little bit here. Secular theories of development are concerned with the middle portion, what the Bible calls fallen redemption. Secularists call problems and solutions. So the secularist says, we have problem, we have a problem. And uh, we need to find solutions. Houston, we have a problem. There we go. Problems and solutions. That, that's their gospel. You have a problem, I have a solution for you. Uh, but these two, that is um, fallen redemption or problems and solutions, can only be understood as part of the larger framework of what God is doing in his world. People with arrested development are image bearers of the creator God. Any effective solutions must carry the hope of future glory. So this person that's struggling your daughter, spina bifida daughter, creating the image of God with a future hope of unimaginable glory up ahead for her. See how that's going to transform everything of our interventions with her. You see? And and see if we didn't if we didn't have this and if we didn't have this, then then why bother? Why bother? Why bother putting the effort and the investment and the and the money and the time and the energy? It's glorious, isn't it? glorious. So why would any bother, anyone bother with a, with a teenager with a speech impediment? Why would anyone bother with, with a child with learning difficulties? Why would anyone bother with, with an 80 year old suffering from Alzheimer's in a rest home? Why not just put her in there and just, you know, let's get on with their lives? The government. Why, why would we bother? Because of image of God and a future hope of unimaginable glory. That's why we bother. So we've got to have the big picture. We've got to have the whole story. So what I want to do here is just introduce you to some of these uh, secular theories relating to lifespan development. Now, the reason we're going through these is not because <laughs> this is the basis on which you'll do your counselling. Um, the reason we're going through this is largely because you're going to uh, encounter these theories in the literature that you're going to be reading and also because we have to, as we go through this course, give some thought to how to take these theories and render them useful for the body of Christ and the glory of God. In other words, remember these theories are concerned only with the middle bit. We're going to have to take these theories and see what difference it makes to these theories when we introduce this one and introduce this one into the full story. It's going to transform these theories. Uh, and where they can't be transformed, we'll discard them. Where they can be transformed, we'll use them for the edification of the body of Christ. So here's some secular theories arising from the observation of the human lifespan that seek to, these theories that seek to account for human development. Seek to account for human development, see, apart from, from God and his providential uh, care of his image bearers. How do they account for it? Well, here's just some of them. There's certainly not all of them. Psychodynamic theories. 
to psychodynamic theories, everything in the present is understood in terms of previous developmental stages, particularly in terms of arrest or delay. So psychodynamic says if you're having problems here, transitioning from here to here, it's because something has gone wrong back here. So we have to go back into your past and we have to go back to where there was an arrest or a delay in your development. We have to go back there and we have to begin there. So here's someone, for instance, who's having trouble as an adult uh, moving into uh, occupation work because they never really learned to read. Now, see, it's fairly obvious that the reason they haven't learned to read is because somewhere back here when they should have learned to read, there was an arrestment or delay or it never happened. And so what you have to do is you've got to take them back and start with Jack and Jill ran up the hill to fetch a pail of water. So you've got to start with the premise. You've got to start with... A, B, C, D, and teach them to read. Well, psychodynamic says it works the same way with our, our internal emotional stuff. If we're having struggles here, it's because back here something happened to rest our psychological development. Um, and so that brings them to say, among other things, that adult life is nothing less than the working out of unconscious childhood conflicts. Uh, they would say that um, adulthood is nothing more or nothing less than working out the convictions and experiences of childhood. Now, you see what they're saying? They're saying all the significant develop, development happens in the early stages of a person's life. After that, it's just a matter of outworking the experience and convictions and beliefs of childhood. And, and if, if, if the psychodynamic counsellor is there going to bring any change here to the adult uh, client they're talking to, the adult counsellor they're talking to, it, it's, not go, it's not going to come about by, by helping the adult to change as an adult. They've got to take the adult back <laughs> to that childhood, you see, to, to, to reconnect with the child within so that some changes can be made back there where the arrestment or the delay took place. different psychologists have different views on this. Freud, he saw all the stages in a person's life in terms of uh, uh, psychosexual development, that he saw it all in terms of, uh, of repressed sexual desires is what in inhibits a person from uh, being able to make successful transitions. Um, he would say that we are all forced to satisfy basic instinctual Instinct, instinctual impulses, that sexual impulses within the constraints of increasingly rigid social expectations. He would say the reason people have problems transitioning from one stage to the next is because they can't give full vent to their sexual desires and the reason they can't give full vent is because they're surrounded by people who won't allow them to. Society, family, religion that won't allow them to. That's why people are so screwed up. Now you see where he see where he gets to that? You see how he gets there? Because if you begin with an assumption, not with this, but if you begin with the assumption here that sexually we're all messed up, okay, and, and see th that accounts now for everything. That was Freud. Uh, Erickson, by contrast, uh, uh, had a greater emphasis than Freud on the social influences rather than the basic impulses. Well Erickson said something very similar, only said it's not sexual, it's social. He says, the social experiences in childhood set you up for whatever, whatever you end up doing in adulthood. And if you're having trouble transition back here, transitioning back here, it's because of what happened in your social development back here. So we've got to take you back. Now, what, what's inherent in that theory is that for someone in adulthood, they, they can't be helped simply with their, the issues that they're experiencing in adulthood. In other words, there's no real development or change that takes place once past you get through Adolescence, we're going to find later on, we look at Freud's stages of development, he stops. He stops with uh, about year 20. For him, there's no further development because at year 20, sexually, we're fully developed people. So for him, there's no further development at all. All the problems we have as adulthood all happen because something went wrong in our sexual development in our childhood and adolescence. Well, that's psychodynamic. Uh, Before we leave psychodynamic, um, is there any role in asking people questions about their past? If they're struggling with a transition here, 
Is there any merit in asking them questions about their past? Yep. Talk to me. Well, because they might have formed a false belief back there, and until that belief's changed. But you can change it now, because it's affecting them somehow, and the Bible has something to say about it, so they can see whether that belief formed back there was right or wrong. So that what, they might have formed a belief back here in their childhood, the result of their upbringing or whatever, a belief which is a false belief, and that false belief is now working itself out in crisis as they try to transition. Yeah. And so, having identified that false belief, you can go back and encourage them to change it, to repent of it, to undo it. So, for instance, you might have a, a father who says to his son, his small son, or, um, or uh, let's say, uh, a son who's 10, 11, 12, something like, um, oh, you're useless, you'll never amount to anything. And so that child now, that young adolescent has a belief in his heart that he's useless, that he'll never amount to anything. That's a false belief. Remember, image of God, it's a false belief. Nevertheless, it's a belief that's been implanted to him. If, if that's what my father says I'm like, then it must be true, because who knows me better than my father does? You see the power of, that, of those death words? And so the child goes, the young man goes into adulthood believing he's worthless, believing he's never going to amount to anything. And so he won't accept responsibility. He won't take responsibility for his life. He won't accept responsibility for caring for others. He's got no reason to. You see, well, so he's going to have trouble transitioning into healthy adult relationships, into healthy adult vocation. And so you've got to, uh, and now if you didn't ask questions about his past, about his family, his family of origin, and you never learned about that, you would be constantly frustrated because all the counts in the world, unless it, as Andrew says, unless it disrupts that false belief and overthrows it and blows it up and replaces it with another belief that he's creating the image of God and his future is the hope of unimaginable glory. He's got no reason to change. Well, you, you might not have to go back and find that story, though. I mean, if you just counsel someone or through and through going, hearing sermons and all that, they see God as their father, greater father, and learn about what he says, they might work it out for themselves without even clicking consciously back to that, although eventually I think they would. So you might, your question might not even actually unearth it, but it might, right. the truth itself, it'd probably be slower, but... So if in a counselling situation you're bringing that truth to bear, mm. but they don't seem to be able to understand it or grab hold of it. Mm. Then you may want to ask some more questions. You know, you want to know what's in his heart is blocking his ability to receive that truth. Mm. And sure enough, there's something there, which perhaps he doesn't even fully understand himself. Mm. What about behavioural learning theories? This is um, this is based on uh, the theories of conditioning that. Um, that through a series of interactions with our environment we become conditioned to learn things and uh, you know the um, the mother who says to her child you're a naughty boy and she says that oh, you're a naughty boy you see that's the conditioning and that's a behavior behavior learning theory says that he'll 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 act that out because he believes that's true see? Um, uh, also if a person's in an environment where there's um, uh, where they're deprived of emotional contact. You see the conditioning, the behavioral learning theorist will say that that's, that's his conditioning, and so he'll go into adulthood unable to show emotion or understand emotion. Um, so a series of interactions with the, the social environment will impede the ability to transition from one lifespan to another. That's the behavioural learning theories, and uh, Bandura and Skinner um, develop, two of the guys develop these theories. They said behaviour is a function of rewards and punishments in the present environment and learned history. There is no significant choosing. In other words, we're largely uh, victims or products of our environment. Um, our environment determines, basically. Our environment as a young person has a determinative impact on our ability to develop or otherwise as adults. Uh, then there's cognitive development. 
Um, the process of setting aside uh, childhood assumptions and demands with a growing preoccupation on problem solving. Now, the cognitive developers, they, they observe children and the way children learn and, it, and the stages that a child goes through in their cognitive or learning abilities. And, um, you know, as the child progresses from uh, building blocks to solving mathematical equations. You see, what are the stages that he goes through in that cognitive development? And the reason they want to understand the stages of that cognitive development is they want to know what interventions they can have in there to ensure maximum development cognitively and the ability to reason and understand. Now, what they noticed was, even without any interventions at all, there was a natural growth and progression um, uh, and uh, towards problem solving. So a child who begins just by building blocks you know, very soon moves on to wanting to solve problems in his environment. Like uh, his, uh, his, his mother's crying and the little child will go up and say, and, and pat the mother and say, it's okay, mummy. You see, it's, there, there's, a, there's a growth there, an awareness, wanting to solve problems. Or, um, you know, the toy is broken and he brings the toy to dad and say, and he says, daddy fix. You see, it's, it's an awareness there, a little bit beyond just building blocks and knocking them over. Now there's an actual awareness that we want to, uh, we want to solve some problems here. We want to make things better than what they are. So the, the cognitive development theorist said that there's an orderly sequential stages of development as the brain grows. And it looks at how information from the environment is processed by the brain. Uh, e.g. self-conception, self problem-solving, and moral judgments are all features of cognitive development. You see what they're doing? See, so here's their redemption. Here's their redemption. The cognitive guys, here's their redemption. If we can help people with problems to think differently and to channel their cognitive development in a different direction, then we can bring our redemption to bear. Sorry, our solutions to bear. <laughs> see, we can save them from their problem. And see, out of this comes uh, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. See, it's, it's based directly on the cognitive development theorists that if we can change the way you're thinking, we can change the way you're behaving. Take this tape out of your head and put in a different tape. Uh, anger management, for instance, is based on that theory that if we can change the way people think, it's cognitive, we can change the way they behave. Um, Piaget was a very famous cognitive developer and he, uh, he looked at the way children learn, he looked at the formal operational stage of cognitive reasoning in children and he, he came up with all kinds of theories about the way children learn which are the basis of education in the Western world today is basically Piaget's theories and uh, every school in the country is based on it and, and uh, what it says is that initially at the formal stage of cognitive development uh, a child is, um, is, is not reasoning conceptually and so uh, you, that only comes about the age seven and onwards can a child reason conceptually before that they just uh, they don't reason, they, they reason in concrete concrete things, this, this, this block and this toy and, and you know and, but from age seven they begin to reason conceptually so there's not much point trying to educate them until they get to age seven that's why you can't teach children about God until age seven, because God's a concept. You see, see how this plays itself out. Now, um, development of Piaget's thinking says not only that, not only can children not really learn till age seven, that before that, it's not much point trying to teach them anything. In fact, it'd be wrong. In fact, it's damaging to teach them anything before then, any kind of structured learning, because they don't have the cognitive development to deal with that. So what we do is just, is just, you know. <laughs> let them play and let them discover their own environment. And so you build a preschool, you see, and you're not supposed to have a door between the outside and the inside. You just have an open space so the child is free to go in and out whenever he chooses to. So you're not restricting his development and discovery of his world. Just like he does at home as a two-year-old, he crawls around the house and, and, and you're supposed to leave all the doors open so he can go anywhere. Because if you restrict him, you see, you, you restrict his cognitive development. Oops. <laughs> You guys are in big trouble. <laughs> so that was Piaget. 
uh, Kohlberg looked at the process whereby a sense of morality develops in cognitive stages. Whereas, whereas Piaget, Piaget said, as we observe children developing cognitively in their reasoning processes as they get older, Kohlberg says, so we can also look at children and observe a developing sense of morality. And he had these 12 stages of, of a developing sense of morality, where you know, a, a, someone who's 40 has a very different sense, developed sense of morality than, say, a four-year-old. And he's interested in those stages because, you know, we're dealing with problems, aren't we? And uh, moral problems are a problem in our society. So how are we going to help people be moral? Well, let's first understand how people come to an understanding of morals. Then maybe we can have some interventions along the way here to help them with their moral transitions from one life stage to another. That's cognitive development. Uh, evolutionary biology sociobiology, adaptation, survival of the fittest, these guys would say, the ones who make the transition successfully are the fittest and the strongest and the smartest and those that fall by the wayside are weaker and ineffective. See, again, we're dealing with problems and solutions. So the, the solution is to ensure that in, the, uh, that we, uh, in our interventions that we help people to adapt adapt to the transition. As they go from here to here, we have to help them to adapt to this one. Change their ad adaptation to this one and help them to adapt to this one so they can transition without crisis. Uh, humanistic psychology has a focus on selfhood, dignity, creativity and individuality, motivated by self-actualization and self-fulfillment. So the reason why you're having a crisis as you transition is because uh, you're not feeling fulfilled by the transition that's been forced upon you. You don't, over here, you don't see the prospect as you go from here to here. As you stand here and, and you're being forced now to, to move over to here, you don't see in here the prospect for self-fulfillment, selfhood, dignity, creativity, individuality that you might have experienced back here. Uh, for instance, um, Here's a child uh, just finishing um, uh, in uh, primary school or intermediate school and they're having to move transition into high school. And it's a crisis for them because they feel safe. They've been in primary slash intermediate school for however many years and they feel self-actualized. They feel uh, safe, they feel secure, they have their friends, and now they're having to transition into a high school and they're faced with a crisis. Um, not unlike when uh, the first day a child goes to school, moving from home into a school environment. Moving from, and, and often this, uh, this comes down to safety, they don't feel safe as they move. A transition, for instance, an old person moving from their own home into a rest home. See, they're, they're faced with this uh, the, the, the rest home is not going to self-actualize them the way living on their own. Self-fulfillment. So here again, you see we have a problem. Uh, moving from here to here, from home to rest home, there's a problem. And what's the solution? The solution is to help them to find in the rest home the means by which they can be self-actualized. They can find their self or their dignity, their creativity, their individuality. And so rest homes put a lot of programs in place to, um, to help people develop a kind of understanding of themselves. Transpersonal, transpersonal psychology. Uh, this is uh, a little more um, obscure. Oneness with all, a unitary, a unitary consciousness, stresses the importance of humanistic spiritual development. Uh, this is, um, you know, that New Age thinking that we're all one, uh, we're all, uh, we all possess the spirituality of God, however you understand Him, and, and this is what unites us. And it's when we, uh, when we start arguing and fighting with one another about our beliefs in God, for instance, where religion divides, so we're... Um, our transpersonal psychology is at war with, it, with itself. And finally, there's the composite or eclectic model, which seeks to combine many of the above, and uh, <clears throat> which is popular with many therapists today. They, rather than coming down any one of these, they will try to use a combination of them, and you can see why. 
you know, we have the problems and we need the solutions and, and there's many different problems out there, so let's just have many different solutions, many different arrows in our quiver, let's have as many solutions to hand as possible as we engage in this futile and never-ending search of trying to deal with the problems without understanding image-bearing and future glory. Is there anything you'd like to say about any of those theories in terms of uh, what you may have encountered in your own life from <coughs> different people or your different life experiences? You might have some more to add to that list. Well, the one thing I found good about what them is it actually makes you think about reflect on life or childhood or that and like problems you have now maybe it was something that you know, you didn't, you didn't think that so whereas I think the church tends not to do any well much reflecting back and it helps people it's just you know, the whole willpower salvation thing, like, try harder, this is what you should do, just do it. <clears throat> but, you know, there's this, this sort of unseen false beliefs in that that people have that don't get touched by that. The reason that he won't, have willpower won't work is because he doesn't actually believe that it will, it will work. So, yeah, I think that's certainly useful if you approach them from a Christian framework. Do any of those theorists uh, theories sound familiar to you as you went through them? Theories that you might have at some stage uh, have come across and have yeah. uh, worked with, understood or lived by, yeah. understood people in terms of? You can see, for instance, we don't put a five-year-old into high school mm. unless they're abnormally brilliant. Doogie Pardon? Doogie <laughs> it's a TV <laughs> and so we can agree with the cognitive therapists, uh, theorists that there are stages of cognitive development. Every parent knows that. But Christian parents know that you don't have to wait till the child is seven to tell them about God. Okay, knowing that we are created in the image of God and that there is a hope of eternal life beyond the lifespan enables us to take the preoccupation of secular thinking with the problems and solutions of lifespan development, their understanding of fallen redemption, and render them useful for pastoral counselling. We do not need to be intimidated by the theorists, we see a bigger picture. Nor do we need to be arrogant toward them, since all that we have and know, we have by grace. Rather, we will walk among the secular theories, taking only that which can be made useful to the body of Christ for the exposing of hard issues, the substance matter of psychology, in order to bring that one's heart to the throne of grace. So if you, if you just uh, imagine for a moment that uh, here we have um, the body and the heart and uh, as the Bible presents us as being the body which dies and the heart that lives forever, that inner part of us that never dies, that seat of our emotions and the Bible has many terms to refer to this inner part of us, heart, soul, spirit, mind, consciousness, uh, joint, marrow, all referring to the same thing, that inner part of us that never dies. And, and uh, when, we're talking about, um, when we're talking about psychology, we're talking about what goes on here. See, we're not, we're not talking about physiology or biology, which is concerned with the body or the physical. We're talking about psychology. Psychology is to do with us and apart. Now, 
You see, psychology recognise, recognises that there is an inner aspect to us. Uh, Freud called it the subconscious, and other people call it, um, you know, other terms. But there is an inner aspect to us which determines so much of our outward. Now, when we talk about dealing with hard issues, when we talk about how a, a crisis brought about by a transition enables hard issues to surface, See, as you go for, as you transition from one span to the other, and you experience a crisis, why are you experiencing a crisis of that transition? Not everyone experiences a crisis when they go when they transition from there to there, but you do. Or this person you're talking to experiences a crisis. Why is it a crisis for them, and it's not a crisis for everybody? Everybody goes through the transition. Not everyone has a crisis. Why do they have a crisis? Well, it's something to do with hard issues. It's something to do with what's going on in here. Now, psychology and psychological theories are trying to understand what's going on inside of us that's producing this crisis. The image bearers are that acknowledging it. They're dealing with the image of God. They're dealing with people who are made up of body and soul. So, here they are, here we are dealing with uh, the issues of the heart, to take the issues of the heart to the throne of grace. And you see how that parallels the substance matter of psychology? They also are trying to unearth or dig out or, or plough up so they can find what lies underneath in the subconscious or the psyche of a person. Without the full picture, they're never going to be able to bring that person to the throne of grace and so see long-lasting life change and resolution of the crisis. Okay, any other thoughts or comments? Evolutionary biology or eugenics. Well, kind of like there's a whole about working of Hitler's thing was the actual the fall or redemption. The fall was actually weak people screwing up the world to get rid of them, and that's how he saved the world for the strong people. So, yeah, it was actually compared to the, all the others, it's like they're all can be evil, but it's like absolutely evil. Because it's just, yeah, there's no really helping anyone. It's just get them out of the way. Now, in a sense, you see, Hitler was being consistent mm, with his with his ungodly presuppositions. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, we we take someone who has a um, has a learning difficulty, for instance, we put lots of resources into helping them, recovery, ready programs, and so on, and. And, and uh, we do that as non-Christians mm. because we see something there that's worthwhile trying to help and try to redeem. You see, we can't, we can't help but act out our image bearing. Mm. Now, Hitler, for instance, he went, he went fully consistently with his fallen presuppositions. That there's nothing worthwhile there. Yeah, well, it was more right if, he, if that's all there is. Because why redeem something that's going to be destroyed? And not carry on, but. Okay. Well, that's it, guys. We're done for tonight. Um, we're uh, so you're all uh, all honky dory for next week. You'll have. Um, part one of Burger Red by next week and be thinking about your own particular life change transition that you want to write a paper on what do you think Mark? Uh, it's quite restrictive they say yeah, from the age of two to six you are this but I'm not sure if I've developed out of playtime yet.
Where, where's that? Uh, it's just somewhere. Uh, describes the... Uh, oh, you're talking about burger. Yeah, burger, yeah. The play years are supposed to be from when you're 26. I don't know how I've um, graduated out yet. No, I, you, no there's, uh, I think there's been some severe restment and delay in your case back here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> what about those, those single guys who never leave home at 40 still living with their parents? Okay, let's pray. Father God, as we have uh, dipped into the subject tonight, we've been struck again by the effect of sin on the world and and, uh, and how all of us struggle, believer and unbeliever, we struggle with crisis and transition. And, uh, and Lord, this is the common lot of fallen humanity, and yet we struggle as those who are creating the image of God, who are united to Jesus Christ in salvation and have a future hope of glory. And Lord, we pray that we would be able to take these wonderful truths that have been sealed to our hearts by way of the gospel, take these wonderful truths and, and use them to help other believers that are, that are struggling in their, in their transitions, in their lifespan. And Father, even beyond that, you give us the opportunity with, with unbelievers also to connect with them in our common cry of humanity as we struggle with crisis and transition that that we can bring a word of hope to bear in their lives also as, as you give us greater understanding uh, as to uh, all that goes into the struggles that we have and the problems that we have. And, and Father, we also pray too that as we go through this course, you teach us much about our own hearts and, and where, um, what it is about our own hearts that, that, that causes crisis to arise and struggles to arise. And, and uh, you'd, you'd help us, Father, to reflect on our lives in a way which, which moves us forward to, to growth, maturity, and greater usefulness in your hands uh, for your ministry and your service within your world. We ask you to be with us now as we travel home and, and guard our hearts and keep us close to Christ. We ask in his name. Amen.